All right, we're moving on now because obviously Everton have been in the news plenty during this international break. They face Manchester United on Sunday. Let's hear from their manager, Sean Dyche. I spoke to the group and I said, look, you know, the, the, the league table is one thing, but, I've, you know, I don't change my story very often. At the end of the day, I've always believed that the, the final league table is the truth of the season. So I'm not going to change that now. I said, look, lads, it's, for sure it, it changed the viewpoint, but it doesn't change what we're doing. You know, in fact, it enhances what we're doing. Yeah, obviously a watershed moment uh, for Premier League football, for English football. There's so much speculation. What we want to know is what happens on the field, and that's what I'm mm. interested in talking about. Uh, Zesh, when you're in a situation like that, and it feels like your backs are against the wall, it's us against everyone, what do you, is that the approach uh, that Sean Dyche is going to have? Is that what he's going to be using to motivate the team? What do you reckon? If you look at what he did with Burnley and how he got them all together and galvanised, I think exactly what he's going to do. So I'll probably create that siege mentality, us against the world. And sometimes it takes a bit of adversity or something out of your control to just galvanise the group, get them stronger, even more together. So I, I think he's going to go down that route. I'd be very yeah. surprised if he take another approach. You could hear in his interview there, yeah. he already believes it's, it's a positive. Yeah. So the players will hear that and they'll feed off those vibes. Yes, and they were already feeding off, um, you know, what he was doing. On the field, you could see the turnaround. Three wins in the last five, only yeah. one defeat in that time. Yeah, only two Premier League clubs <clears throat> have got a better record in that time as well. So I, I'm going to, you know me, I do like to maybe put my neck on the line. I fancy Everton in this fixture. Okay. I really do. I am not convinced by Manchester United at all. If you think about the United seven Premier League wins so far this season, they've all come from this, uh, via the same scoreline. 1-0, the single goal. Right. And they are a team of fragile confidence still. They've got to go to Goodison Park. Mm. If it were at Manchester United, maybe I'd probably give them the edge. But I think as far as Sean Dyche's team is concerned, this almost is, dare I say, a perfect motivation for them to really go out and show some leadership. And that's yeah. what he's done with these players. He's yeah. turned them into leaders. James Tarkovsky in your position, yeah. centre-half. I mean, he is a guy who can strike a, cent a set-piece um, in front of him. Decoury, I know you're a big fan of him. Yeah, a big fan of Decoury. I think when you're looking at midfield players, you're looking at what three things do they do. They score, create or stop. So top midfielders will be doing at least two. But what I've seen of Decoury now, I think he's just turned 30. He's doing all three. So he can score goals, you can see that he can create goals and he's also working very well in between the boxes. So not only is he very useful and helpful for his defence, but he's also getting up in and around the attackers, scoring goals, arriving onto crosses and helping the team win. So as a defender, if you had him in front of you, it's like a dream because you know he's going to work really well between the boxes and he's going to be the energiser of your team. Mm. So you've got different types of midfielders. He looks like, to me, he's the one who's grabbing the game by the scruff of the neck. Mm. When the goal is getting tough, he's the one that's driving everyone forward and he's doing really well. I think he's matured now as a player this season. He signed a new contract at the club. Sean Dyche has made him the most important person at the club. Last season, he scored the goal that saved him from relegation, carried that form into this season, has been a really vocal voice. I remember when they had a few problems under Dyche's predecessor, and um, Ducouri was targeted. Other players in the dressing room stood up for him. He's a really popular figure in yeah. the dressing room and he translates that form to the pitch. And I think on Sunday they will be warriors against Manchester United. I think whatever happens, they'll get carried out on their shields. Speaking of Manchester United, Eric Ten Hag <clears throat> has some injury updates on Andre Onana and Rasmus Hoyland. Let's hear from him. Hi, Eric. Hi. Um, can you give us an update? On the injury situation first, particularly Rasmus Hoyland and your goalkeeper Andre Anana. Um, Andre is uh, okay. Uh, he uh, stepped in training um, today. He's good. Uh, Rasmus still, it's, I think, it's a close finish. Uh, he's training. He's down. Of his outside. Um, yeah, he's making very good steps, and yeah, we have to wait till tomorrow. Then we will make a final decision. In terms of other injuries, is there any timescale yet on Luke Shaw's injury and when he might be back? Luke Shaw will be available for Sunday. He will be in the squad. That's excellent news. Um, in terms of the fixture itself, your form in the Premier League at least is 
is the best in the country right now. So perhaps some of the headlines are not quite what they seem. In terms of the form in the Premier League, do you feel you have turned the corner in recent games? Uh, definitely, we uh, we have seen a turning point. Uh, we have seen that uh, um, yeah, how we deal with certain mm -hmm. situations that we uh, that we built that we built on a certain foundation, and, and now we have to to build on. And we go in a massive month, and yeah, we are really looking forward with confidence because, as you say, um, in the Premier League, everyone is winning from everyone, and there are no easy games for no one. So every team, every team will drop points, uh, but yeah, the last five games uh, we won four, and that gives us confidence uh, to go in the next games. How difficult do you think it's going to be at Everton on Sunday? They they've lost their ten points. Their supporters are very angry. You're banned from the technical area. How, how difficult is it going to be to manage that game? But it's always about us, and I can see uh, the opposition, and I can see they are mad. But then finally, it's about us. So if they if they are met and they are, that's their fuel, we have to match those standards. And and when we match the standards, we have a very good chance to win the game. You then have to go to Galatasaray. You then have to go to Newcastle. Tests of temperament and, and, and maybe mental strength as well as the physical side. How how difficult is it to coach your players and get them prepared mentally as well as physically? Yeah. We started eh, early today eh, with that. Eh, then we go in a week, very condensed. We play three games in six days, and yeah, as a group, as a squad, and eh, we have to deal with that. What do you mean by dealing with it and preparing for it? Do you speak no. to them about it? Of course, and we have a plan, a strategy for it, and and we we make the players aware, and they have to take responsibility in it. But especially, it's about cooperation. Damien. How significant is Luke Shaw's return, Eric, uh, in terms of leadership on the pitch and the balance of the team? Uh, you, can, you can mention many things. Eh? You can mention his physique, you can mention his technical ability, um, his leadership. Yeah, it's, it's clear. Um, a long time in the season, we didn't even have a left fullback. Um, so, yeah, we are very happy he's back. Um, so, that's, that's a good sign. But um, yeah, he will help us that we are more stable. I'm, I'm sure of that. And given the atmosphere at Everson, are you going to have a special word with your players about maintaining discipline and not perhaps getting carried away with the, the intensity of the occasion? Yeah, but I think we you should also we, we, we step forward in that um, recently. And this season, we make some steps there. Uh, we have a good form. We also have a good away form. Um, so uh, yeah, we have a strong belief. That we know uh, what we have to do uh, um, to to have the platform to win games. Jim. Yep. Thank you. Hi, Eric. Um, can I ask about Johnny Evans and how he's getting on? I know he missed the, the Luton game. Is he in contention for Sunday? And can I ask about Rafael Varane? There've been reports of disagreements with him. Uh, can you clarify what the situation is there? No. So uh, to to Johnny. Um, yeah, he's on the way back. He's not not ready for Everton, but will not take long. <laughs> Rafa Ferran, yeah, it's I don't know where you're talking about. It's rumours. It's a um, very important player, and but there's internal competition, and uh, and that should be in the top club as we are. There is internal competition, uh, and when you have to decide on two players who do brilliant, Rafa Ferran and Harry Maguire. Yeah, you have also that. You have to make a choice for that position. Okay. I think it's 13 goals in 12 league games. Is there an acceptance now that you may need to get an in, in a new goal scorer mm. in January, strengthen the attack? I'm confident uh, we will we will get a point. Our players are able to score goals, and um, some and they, they showed it already. Uh, Ressi scored last season 30 goals. Um, Rasmus Hoyland scored five goals in Champions League. This is massive. And not many players across Europe uh, who, can, uh, who can deliver that. So our players are capable of scoring goals. And there will come a point they will do. And as a team, it's good. Uh, we are, I think, fifth rank 
in the Premier League by creating chances. So yeah, well, they have to step up. They know that, but that is you have to deal with that uh, with those pressure that is the standard of Man United. Uh, but our players have the abilities to score goals. Chris. Hi Eric, you banned from the touch line on Sunday. In hindsight, the booking against Luton, the other two cards you got before that, were they correct or do you think that more can be done to improve the relationship between managers on the touch line and the match officials? Nah. It's, um, let's say this, uh, it's, yeah, Ben, uh, and you're not always agreeing <laughs> with the refereeing and I think Many decisions again this season were against us. I saw a list. We are uh, the number 18th uh, in the league, uh, but yeah, still I have to accept it. And yes, now I bend. Um, it can be an advantage. Uh, I have a better overview. Do you think it, it's kind of a two-way street where the managers maybe have to not show their frustration as much, but also the match officials need to be more understanding? Um, Definitely, you have to behave yourself there. Um, to explain, even when they make mistakes. Um, sorry. Hey, um, what do you make of Everton's uh, ten-point ban over financial fair play breaches, and how much of that is a consideration at Manchester United, the financial fair play landscape? Uh, I, I can't tell because I don't know the details about it. So why? So, so I don't have an opinion about that. And of course, it's when I was Everton. Uh, Fans, I, I can uh, imagine they are very mad, but yeah, we can do nothing for it, and only we have to play against them. So yeah, we have to match their standards. In terms of the picture at Manchester United, how much of that? Pardon? I'm sorry. In terms of the picture at Manchester United, though, how much of financial fair play regulations are an impact on what you can do in, in the January transfer window, for example? No, but that's not only now we're talking now January, but it was also uh, the previous window and the window before. Uh, <coughs> was always is that. Yeah, a limit how you uh, in what case you can do business and yeah so we have to match it but it limits you in the things you can do we talk so much about manchester united and then in preparation for this i go and i look at the form and they are the form team in the premier league four wins no, in the last five julian no there's um, i'm i can't get can I, I just can't get carried away by them the, the, because look they're winning but they're winning against teams in the lower reaches of the Premier League as against struggling teams, against teams like Brentford who go ahead and don't have the confidence to see it out and they sit back and they invite pressure on them. But as soon as they come up against teams that are better, they make that step up in class, they get ruthlessly exposed. And I'm not confident about them going into this game. Do you know, when they show the fixtures and the results and the table, there's no space for comments. <laughs> Yeah, no, you're right, you're right. And, I, and every time I come on this show, I spend the weekend worrying about what prediction I have. <laughs> Isn't it remarkable? Because I'm, I'm with you exactly. When you look at everything that's going on, now there's talk about Varane as well. Um, you know, so much going on around Man United, and yet the numbers don't lie, the results no, no. don't lie. Four wins in five. Yeah, winning breeds confidence. And sometimes you win games by big margins, small margins, but when you win a couple of back-to-back -back games, as a player in the group that's winning, just gives you that belief yeah. and confidence and they can start to enjoy their games, play with a bit more freedom and a bit more energy, excitement in front of the crowd, especially when they play at Man United. Well, Sesh, don't you worry that the, 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 the issues that Julio raises, for example, at centre half, that's mm. the, almost arguably the most important area of the pitch. That's the pitch, that's the area... If they're doing well in that area, they provide the foundations yeah. for the more expressive, yeah. offensive players to express themselves. And yet you've got Varane, a serial winner with Real Madrid, unhappy that he's not playing. Mm. You've got Harry Maguire, so many people not quite convinced by him, <clears> even <throat> though he's doing well. Aren't you convinced that there are those issues at, at centre-half? Yeah, you always need more than two or three centre-halves, especially at a big club with so many fixtures. There's always likely to be injuries. But centre-halves is about partnerships. So when you find a partnership that's leading to wins, it's very rare when you're playing that you come out unless there's a free game week and the manager wants to change it. But if there's one partnership that's working, leading to results, and you're not playing, you have to stay professional and wait for your opportunity to come. And then when you get that opportunity, you have to try to make sure the team wins and you're part of clean sheets. So it's, it's not easy when you're not playing. 
But when you are playing, it's also equally difficult because you know someone with top quality, like you mentioned, is waiting mm. for you to slip up and take your shirt. So they have to stay switched on and concentrated for the whole game. Yeah, Maguire's doing so well. A certain politician on the African continent had to apologise <laughs> to him in Parliament. <laughs> I cannot wait to hear what you have to say in our new and improved Team Talks prediction section. Are you guys ready for this? Are you ready, Zesh? Are yeah, you ready? Let's go. He looks so nervous. Here's what's going to happen. We are about to go through every fixture in the Premier League this weekend, give you a brief score and a justification for why. <laughs> are you ready? Are you ready? Right. We're ready. Let's, let's start. The big one. At lunchtime, Man City versus Liverpool. Shall we get Darren to go first? Either or. I'm, I'm OK. I was okay. just about to speak. Right, there you go. <laughs> right, Manchester City, 2-1 because I just feel they've got goals from all over the pitch and Liverpool might have that switch off at the back. Yeah, I agree with that, City. I think it'd be, probably be more goals, maybe 3-2. Uh, both teams will score, but City at home never lose and I think City are going to edge it. Next match, Burnley versus West Ham. What are we going to see? I'll go first. 1-1 one, one in this one. Um, I don't think either side have the ability to kill the other off. Uh, West Ham's confidence is a little bit fragile. Burnley just seem to lack that killer instinct as well. I'm going to say 2-1 Burnley. I think this is the game where the turning point will come for their season. I think they've had a lot of winless games and you just need someone or something to spark you off. And I think this is the game. I'm going to stick with you, Zesh. Luton versus Crystal Palace. 1-1. I think it's going to be two teams that are good on the counter-attack, two teams that are, will try to be solid. I can't see Luton going gung-ho, but... Palace always score. They're always vulnerable. They're exciting on the attack. So, 1-1. One, one. I agree with him. <laughs> Same justification and everything. Same justification. Copy-paste. <laughs> Next game, Newcastle versus Chelsea. Starting with you, Darren. Right, I know you've got, you haven't got a lot of time left, so I'm going to be very straightforward with this. Newcastle don't lose at home. I think the last game for Chelsea was an aberration. Newcastle, even though they've lost players, to edge this 1-1-0. One, one, I'm going to say 2-1 to Newcastle because they've got momentum. The scoring goal, Chelsea have scored four recently, so they might score one. I think it'll be the end of the clean sheet run. But just that atmosphere, that stadium, going home, home win 2-1. Forest Brighton? Forest Brighton, I'm going to go for an away win 2-0. I think Brighton have had a lot of draws recently, and I think that they've worked hard in, in defence this week, by all accounts, and I think we'll get a clean sheet and an away win. Forest to win this one, 1-0, one because Brighton do like to stick to their principles. But when you're going for a bad run, sometimes you have to be able to adapt. I think Forest will edge it. Darren, Sheffield United versus Bournemouth. Bournemouth are in good form. I think they're going to go to United and win. I think them to win 1-0. I'm going to go the other way. Sheffield United <laughs> to win 2-1. <laughs> I think they've, Sheffield United have had a win and a draw in recent games. They've got a bit of momentum and they've got kind of nothing to lose, everything to gain if they can get another win to get like, a few more points on the board. We've got to zip through the next one, so let's go. Brentford Arsenal. Brentford Arsenal, 2-1 away win. Uh, Arsenal to win this one, yeah, too good, too much quality in the final third. Tottenham versus Villa. 1-1, <sighs> because both sides, uh, li uh, Aston Villa not a strong away from home, but Spurs are missing key players, but they do have Son, they do have Brennan Johnson, 1-1. I'll go with that as well, 1-1. One, one. I just think they've, there's quality all over the pitch and they might just nullify each other. Right, score for Everton. Or Fulham, 1-0 home win. Uh, I think, yeah, Fulham at home. I mean, uh, uh, Wolves, that they do like... 1-1 one, one I'm going to go with because uh, Wolves don't know when they're beat. Sesh is giving you the stank eye now. <laughs> <laughs> one, one. Why, do you, why are you so confident that Fulham are going to win? I just think because the dots come in next. They've got Liverpool away... And you know before you go to Anfield, you need confidence, you need a win. So that next game is not as much pressure on that one. So, and I've, it's my former club, so I need to back yeah. into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have a couple of seconds left, and that gives me just enough time to ask you what game you're most looking forward to this weekend. City Liverpool, I think, is going to be another classic. Two teams committed to attacking, they've both got title aspirations. Liverpool are back to where they used to be. I think this is going to be a belter. This is the one. This is the one, not just here, but obviously all over the world as well. Just because the name's on show, the quality on show, and it's going to be an exciting, entertaining game. Anywhere in the world, Old Trafford in Manchester. I'm Derek Ray, ready to bring you commentary, and joining me is the former Arsenal defender, Lee Dixon. 
And if the game is as enticing on the pitch as it looks on paper, we're not going to be disappointed. It is Manchester United and they face Burton Albion. Thanks, Derek. Well, both managers will be reminding their players how important it... Well, it could be on for him here. That ball was put into the right area, but no one able to capitalise. Couldn't quite hang on. Well, nothing untoward happened. Bruno Fernandes. Greenwood. Not a fantastic piece of defending, was it? Is it going to be? And a goal! Just what the fans wanted to see. The ideal way to begin. Well, this is worth another look, Derek. Lovely movement and guile to easily evade the defender. And then a 2v1. Both of them teasing the goalkeeper. That really is a lovely worked goal. One nil then. And he read it superbly. It's going to be United's free kick. Mason Greenwood. It's with McTominay. Cavani. More than decent this from United. Vital interception. The danger was very real. Mancien Powell excellent block oh great block well they no longer have the ball Fred Mancien disappointing pass Bruno Fernandes. Now the attack looks promising. Crossing possibilities. McTominay. Good defending. Rowe. 